So I think we can start. Uh, I'm still not sure whether I should be looking at this audience or this way in order to look at this audience. <laughs> I'm going to turn this way and see the people in front of me. So, okay, we're ready to go for the second Coxeter lecture. Uh, welcome everybody to the Fields Institute for this event. And today, Udi is going to tell us about on approximate subgroups. Okay, thanks very much. Um, right, so I'll start by saying some general things about approximate subgroups and then go back and recall uh, a little bit of what um, I discussed yesterday. Um, okay, then use it to, to give a structure theory. So what is an approximate subgroup? We have a group and uh, we if we have a subset, we can consider um, inversion and we can consider multiplication on the subset. So it's just a set of all products of pairs. And I guess the subsets I will consider will always be symmetric and include one so that we don't have to think too much about left, right, translates and so on. Um, now the key notion is of commensurability, which is usually defined for subgroups, but we can define it for subsets. It means that each one is covered by finitely many translates of the other one. Um, okay. So uh, certainly in particular, if there's some finitely additive measure around, then one has non-zero measure if only the other. And um, okay, now uh, the definition uh, that Terry Tao gave is that a symmetric subset is an approximate subgroup if it's commensurable to, to the product set. And then it will also be commensurable to the second or to the third or fourth product sets so in other words, it's not actually a subgroup, um, but pretty close. I mean, you need to correct by finitely many translations. If some elements when you multiply go out by finitely many corrections by translation, you can get them back in. Um, and um, a very close uh, formulation, if X is finite, is in terms of size. If there's a bound K such that X, X is at most K times X, uh, then you can show that there's a nearby, there's a, well, there, there exists a, um, an approximate subgroup in this sense commensurable to X. Conversely, of course, if X is an approximate subgroup, then X times X, well, yeah, so it will have size at most a number of translates times X. So not to have finite approximate subgroups means that you're assured to have good growth, that no matter what subset you choose, if you apply the group operation to it, you get a substantially bigger uh, subset by some. Okay. Um, okay, so here are, so these things occur in many branches of mathematics. Um, and um, uh, let me just mention some classical results for the case of finite approximate subgroups. And of course, every finite subset is a finite approximate subgroup because XX is finite. But the idea is really when you say finite subset, you mean a family of finite subsets, which are K approximate for the same K. Or model theoretically, uh, you can think of uh, pseudo finite um, or non standard analysis. Um, Okay, so Freiman, for the needs of Fourier analysis, considered them around 1960. Uh, and he classified the approximate subgroups of Z, for example. And you should think of truncated arithmetic progressions. In Z, if you have uh, an arithmetic progression and you truncate it it's symmetrically, then it's clear that XX will just be twice you know, the size of X. You can, two translates of X will cover it. Let's say the interval from minus n to n becomes the interval from minus 2n to 2n. Um, okay, but it's already a non trivial theorem. Um, Erdos and Semeredi considered what, what does not appear to be subgroups. It seems to be it has two group operations, namely plus and times. And they, they call it a sum product phenomenon. But it seems very difficult. Well, you can get arithmetic progressions, you can get geometric progressions but it's quite difficult to get subsets which are closed under both. And uh, in fact, you expect that 
if you get almost the square of the number of elements by one of them, uh, and that's still open, but they did manage to prove uh, that at least you get more elements, in fact, in an exponential sense. Uh, Elik has improved it to reals. And once you're over a field, you can already see that actually this is a special case of talking about approximate subgroups. Um, you can think if you have X, which is an approximate sub ring, then somehow X times X or something like that, I think, will be an approximate subgroup of this two dimensional group, which includes both addition and multiplication. Um, okay, the later uh, Bougain, Katz, and Tao uh, did it for finite fields. And um, so people started being interested in, okay, this is for somehow two dimensional groups now. Well, Helfgott was able to do it for three dimensional groups, later more. Um, okay, and uh, I gave a qualitative version of that, which works for any group like SLN of FP. Um, but the, the really good quantitative result was obtained by uh, simultaneously by Boyer, Green, and Tao, and by Peter Sabo, which later fed into to a lot of applications uh, concerning, well, what happens when you start generating a group. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, so that was about finite subgroups of linear groups. Uh, in model theory, they also occur in, in various places. So uh, we're quite used uh, to looking at, so in omega stability, looking at uh, groups, uh, well, definable group theory, you only really see definable subgroups. But the moment you go to super stability, you see plenty of infinitely definable subgroups. For example, the connected component uh, of the group is defined to be the smallest uh, infinitely definable subgroup which has bounded index in the group. So the index doesn't depend on which model, well, it's bounded independently of which model you choose. And generally speaking, when we talk about an infinitely definable group, it's an infinitely definable set, which happens to be a subgroup when you interpret it in a saturated model. Um, and if you apply compactness and you think what it means, you see that it means that you can express S as an intersection. Um, you might as well think of countable intersections of symmetric definable subsets, well, which are not subgroups, but um, somehow squaring the n plus first one is contained in the nth one, at least. When you take the intersection, you do get a subgroup. And it's very convenient model theoretically that you're able to think of subgroups, so they enjoy the usual properties of groups. Um, even though what they code is really a commensurable, yeah, a class of definable approximate subgroups. So in general, for an infinitely definable group, it's not necessarily, they're not necessarily commensurable, but if the index is bounded independently of the model, that amounts to all the ANs being commensurable. And in particular, because you also have this, they're all approximate subgroups. Okay. So, in, so this is somehow denoted by G00. This is the intersection of all uh, infinitely definable ones of bounded index. And people are also interested, so people are also interested in the smallest invariant subgroup of uh, bounded index. So it's no longer assumed to be definable, just automorphism invariant. And that means you can take it to be generated by partial types. Um, and with a little thought, you see that any, yeah, that to say that G000 equals G, for example, to say that there are no invariant subgroups of bounded index is exactly to say that you have an absolute upper bound on how many steps it takes an approximate subgroup to generate G. Okay. Sorry. So, What's the difference between G000 and G00? This is the smallest subgroup, which is invariant under automorphisms of the model and has bounded index. Okay, so G00 is infinitely definable by definition. Okay, 
And this one is going to be roughly, it's going to be generated by an infinitely definable set. It's definable like that. And that's the most general you can get in a saturated model. Um, yeah, more, yeah. You don't get more complicated than that. Okay. Um, yeah, no, so that, so that uh, has been significant in, in, in multi groups. Sorry, Udi, but this X uh, in this third item, it is definable or type definable approximate subgroup, yeah? Or um, maybe I'm making a mistake, but I thought it would be enough to say, yeah, definable. Yeah, definable. Okay, right? yeah. Every okay. definable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Every definable, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, all, all the talk really, I will think about definable approximate subgroups to some extent, it's tautological because if I have an arbitrary one, well, I'm just going to take the structure which has G multiplication and X, but nevertheless, that's how I'm going to think. In some other places where they occur is, uh, well, the first place was in the proof of Zilber's indecomposability theorem. And the way it goes is you have some G maybe has finite molar rank and you take X definable and then you just go on and look at X times X, X times X times X and so on. But eventually the dimension stabilizes. So eventually uh, something like X to the fourth becomes, well, the same dimension to X to the five. And it's basically an approximate subgroup situation. It's very much like having the same rank in different degree. It's basically like uh, being commensurable. You need to adjust a bit. Uh, this was very, very powerful uh, and it got generalized to many situations. For example, uh, the analysis that I have with Anand of definable groups in pseudo-finite fields very much depends on the same idea. Well, there it's a finite S1 rank. It's no longer stable, it's simple, but um, similar things happen. Uh, in fact, closer to the story of uh, approximate subgroups. Um, yeah, I mentioned that the main theorem on quasi-finite structure, which is a finiteness theorem saying they fall into finitely many definable classes. Um, they play some role, and I mentioned them because that's the first place that I'm aware of where they don't converge to G. So they don't converge to a subgroup in finitely many steps. So they only converge to a disjunctive definable subset a priori, um, but nevertheless, you have to deal with them. Um, yeah, so uh, here in this definition, there somewhere, I'm just saying that a n divided by s is bounded. I'm not saying necessarily that g divided by s is bounded. Yeah, for example, if you have some vector space and maybe you have some families of definable linear forms on it, that's what happens in quasi-finite structures and you take the family and you do a process like Zilber in decomposability, but you're not within any definable group. Uh, and nevertheless, you manage to show that they converge under some assumptions. All right, so that was just to say that they occur in different uh, areas. Um, later to, on Thursday, we'll see that they occur also in, in, uh, in number theory. Um, okay. And what are some of the, the existing results on where they come from when they're not contained in some very well understood group, just approximate subgroups of some group. So there's a wonderful theorem of Gromov in 1981 uh, that later was, uh, was an, an addition, multi-radic addition by, uh, and, in, and analysis by uh, Van den Dries and Wilkie um, that, if you have a group of polynomial growth, so you have it generated by some finite set X and X to the N, for example, is N to the power of K or something polynomial like that. Uh, that's the assumption. And if you think about it, that implies that it has plenty of approximate subgroups. So if you take A to be X to the two to the N where you choose N rather large, um, and you compute the size, well, it comes out to two to the K A. And two to the K doesn't depend on, on the size of A. Okay, so it's an, it's an approximate subgroup. Um, well, here you assume that you have many of them. So in some sense, if you look at the two to the nth one, 
then you've built in a chain below you. And Gromov's description is that, well, you, go to, you look at the group from afar, you go far away so that this looks like it has uh, size one, some radius one, and then within it, if you think of doing that in Z squared, you see that you will see within that something like a piece of R squared if you look from far away. Um, so he shows that these must be basically nilpotent or nilpotent by finite. Um, yeah, and his proof, well, it uses metric space. It uses the group as a metric space and it goes to uh, Montgomery Zippin to certain to, to theorems on the structure of locally compact groups. Um, okay, and I gave a different connection for a single approximate subgroup uh, to also to Lie groups ultimately. Um, and, uh, okay, so instead of assuming, so if you assume something is finite or pseudo finite, it has a measure. You can assign a number to, to the set and to various subsets nearby. For example, to the translates of the set or to the intersection of two translates. And you say that the approximate subgroup is amenable if it's not necessarily finite, but there is a finitely additive measure um, which is invariant under translation and which gives it measure not infinity and not zero. Okay, that's an amenable approximate subgroup. And in fact, the hypothesis was a bit weaker than a model theoretic hypothesis on a certain idea. Um, okay, so that, okay, I'll, I'll describe that a bit more closely later, but it somehow describes the general shape of amenable approximate subgroups. On the other end, if you still want to do the pseudo finite ones, you can say much more, and Bouillard, Green, Tao uh, were able to show um, generalizing Gromov's theorem that um, uh, that they all they all come from nilpotent things. Of course, you can take a homomorphism into a nilpotent group and pull back an approximate subgroup, and it'll still it'll still be an approximate subgroup. But the origin of it it will be in the nilpotent group. Okay, so like, as I explained with Gromov's theorem, all of them, you, 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 you find a Lie group by first finding a locally compact group. And you find a locally compact group by finding, going down. In other words, if a locally compact group is, uh, I don't know, R squared, you somehow are supposed to recognize a piece that looks pretty much like the set you started with X in the sense that within X, you find X prime and then X double prime, which are smaller and they look like subsets of this square. Okay, so you recognize it by somehow going below some compact neighborhood. And we're going to see that none of these methods have a chance of working for a general approximate subgroup because sometimes it has no proper approximate subgroups of, of a smaller scale. So this will, you might still be able to recognize a locally compact group, which has the same rough structure, but not using methods like this. Yeah, so more theoretically that meant finding a stabilizer, finding a type which, um, well, finding an infinitely definable group, which uh, to which the given definable one was an approximation. Um, okay, so now I need to go into a little bit more detail about this, and I will give two sources of approximate subgroups. So one of them I described is locally compact groups. So you have a lo any locally compact topological group, so the group operations are continuous, and it has a compact neighborhood of the identity, U. And the claim is U is an approximate subgroup. It is basically immediate because um, u times u um, is also compact. And it's obviously contained in some infinite union of translates of u, just all the translates. So therefore it's contained infinitely many. Okay. So part of, uh, yeah, so the, so the previous 
uh, yeah. So, so somehow the previous result could be says that that this this property, along with having some kind of measure, is characteristic of what a locally compact group is. If you're just given that property of an approximate subgroup plus some amenability, you recover a locally compact group. And the goal today is to remove amenability from this. Um, yeah, so here I gave some examples of locally compact groups. Out of these, uh, we have Lie groups, and this is a Piatic Lie group, and this already involves putting together uh, many Lie groups and Piatic groups, uh, the Adels, but um, for the purpose of approximate subgroups, uh, there are theorems saying that the theorem saying that, for example, a connected locally compact group um, has a homomorphism into a, um, a Lie group with compact kernel. Now, a compact kernel, if you think about it, if you divide by it, it's not going to change very much. It will change. Um, things only by commensurable amounts. So basically, if you get in your, yeah. So even though this class seems to be extremely general, the class of approximate subgroups you get this way. And if you allow pullbacks by homomorphisms, you might as well restrict attention to Lie groups. Uh, Lie groups are very well understood. They're really de de determined just by some finite number of real numbers and by some subgroup of a finitely generated abelian groups. So there's very close control on them. Um, yeah, so from a rather general situation, you're getting to something quite concrete. Um, yeah, so, so here's the statement that once again, under the amenability assumption, um, the commensurability class is the pullback of the canonical commensurability class of some Lie group. Um, okay, so all these in Lie group, all the compact open neighbors of the identity are commensurable to each other and they form the canonical class. Um, right, furthermore, yeah, okay. If you say not, you can, you can actually, if you say that the Lie group has no compact normal subgroup, it's unique, so you can completely describe it just by giving um, an approximate subgroup. Okay, so that's been fairly more familiar in the last decade or so to some of us. But there's another origin of approximate subgroups, which uh, at least I was not uh, aware of until very until fairly recently, and it's called quasi-morphisms. Uh, so a quasi-morphism um, is a function into the real numbers, which is more or less a homomorphism. Well, not quite, but the error set is bounded. Okay. So the way I denote such things is I say F goes, is a, is a map from G to R, well, kind of modulo minus one, one. That would mean that it's bounded by the interval minus one, one, which of course you can assume if you were normalized in this case. Um, so these are very well understood. There's a technology of how to deal with them. They're not, I mean, it's not always easy to come up with such things for important groups, people really try, but there is a general theory. Uh, this one is very close to the, well, says a lot in the O minimal case. Uh, there's work of Bourget, Monod and other people, uh, Yotzi, which, for example, prove for many significant groups like SLNZ or groups like that, uh, that there are no uh, non-trivial quasi-homomorphisms. So trivial, it counts as trivial if it's either a homomorphism or a bounded function or a sum of two such things. So Udi, what is G star in this remark? Uh, is there a G star? You know, it would be so nice if I could see the face of whoever is asking the question, but isn't there somewhere oh, I can do that? Oh, can okay, sorry, that's me, Christoph. Yeah. I, I could try. <laughs> Yeah, I thought it was you, but I could see. So where, where is G star? In, ah, in, there. In, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I just jumped to the fact, to, to the literature. 
but yeah, but now I'll explain this remark. So just take uh, an ultra power or something, take a non-standard version. So oh. I'm thinking of, so the, the, the inverse image, yeah, so I'm thinking in a definable way. So I really always think of take, going to a saturated model. So if I have F from G to R, then I also have F star from G star to R star, which is somehow a saturated version, maybe an ultra product, okay? Yes, sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I can just compose it with the quotient map R star modulo, uh, well, let's take the convex hull of R, okay? So just identify two non-standard reals if the difference is finite. So all I'm saying is that this is this composition is actually a homomorphism. And, for, and, and in fact, this identifies the quasi-morphism. So the quasi-morphisms embed into the homomorphisms from a saturated version of G into our star mod R. You don't get all of them. So it's delicate which ones you get and which ones you don't, which ones are represented by some internal function. But nevertheless, it shows you that you're a little bit in the abelian world that's closely connected to questions that people in both like Ismatulin Matulin and other people studied about um, when the commutator subgroup generates infinitely many steps. If it doesn't generate infinitely many steps, then this homomorphism, this class will be non-trivial and among them, you can look for quasi-morphisms. Okay. Uh, sorry, Udi. Uh, by embed in the remark, you mean when you identify quasi homomorphisms up to uh, find a finite error, no, or something? Because it's yes. not going to be injected. Yes, of course. up to bounded ones. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, in fact, there's a way to choose canonically. So, yeah, you don't count quasi morphisms as different if they differ by a bounded function. And there is a way to choose canonically one, which is homogeneous. So it satisfies f of x to the n equals n f of x in any given class, and then it's unique. So this is called homogeneous. Um, yeah, yeah. By the way, we should do what Christoph does. I don't know what he does, but turn on the video when you ask a question, then I can see where it is or, or something. Um, please. Yeah. Okay. So now here's an exercise that if you have a quasi-morphism like that, so the error is between minus one and one, if you take pullbacks of sets that are large enough compared to the error set, they don't notice very much that it's not a homomorphism. They think it's a homomorphism. This is the rough idea. So the exercise is the, the pullback of a neighborhood is an approximate subgroup. It's a file. So the neighborhood itself is a two approximate subgroup. And if you pull it back, there's some noise created by the fact that F is only a quasi-homomorphism, but it's not too bad. You can do this exercise and you can see that the pullback will be a five approximate subgroup. Now, I didn't study this in detail, so I'm not sure if it's a four or three approximate subgroup. You get five very easily. Maybe somebody can tell me if it's four. Um, also, the smaller R gets, the closer you get to this place, which is rough, which is not, which is the error set, the less you know. So as soon as R is bigger than one, you get an approximate subgroup, but you get this nice bound only when R is big enough. Um, and in fact, this works much more generally. So I have this notation that F is a homomorphism from a group G into a group L, which is going to be a Lie group usually, with error K. So K is a compact set which absorbs the error. So it means that f of x, y lies in f of x, f of y, k, in case normal. Um, then you can still do this exercise. And the pullback of any open neighborhood of k, it will be an approximate subgroup. Um, so one example of the quasi-morphism is once again, the automorphisms of r less than with a successor function which we saw as Ziegler's example uh, when we took it modulo L for large L. But you don't really have to take it modulo L. If you want it to become very first order, you should take it modulo L and then multiply all Ls, but we'll see local logic very soon, which allows you to look at this. So anyway, uh, if you have an automorphism of this, 
just mapping G to just G of zero is a quasi-morphism because uh, if you compose two of them, then um, okay. So if G goes to, for example, if G of zero is between minus one and one, and the age of zero is about n, then um, you can easily see because it preserves this that composing them will also be between okay n and n plus two something like that. Yeah. So they they appear in geometry. This was introduced by Milner uh, in connection with uh, well classification of connections on curves. Um, okay. So this kind of bounded cohomology thing has appeared sometimes in model theory, for example, uh, in, a, in a paper of uh, Kobe Pedersen and Anna Pile and myself on which involved central extensions, where we found that certain cohomology classes of central extensions are definable and bounded. Most likely, all this is, you know, that was really a very special case of uh, Gromov's result. Um, or, well, at least, but, okay. We didn't know about that at the time. Um, hi, Ubi. Uh, can I ask a question before you move on? Uh, hi. Uh, so see anybody, but yeah, okay. Oh, uh, so my question is that uh, are you suggesting that um, the fact that there are quasi homomorphism, which uh, does not come from group homomorphism, uh, comes from the non-triviality of this bounded homology? Yes. More precisely, the, the class of uh, quasi... So what it is exactly is you have uh, the second bounded cohomology. Uh, it, admit, it admits a map into just the second purely sub-theoretic or group-theoretic cohomology, and the kernel of that is exactly the... Yeah, the quasimorphisms up to yeah. right. the classes of quasimorphism. Um, yeah, but it's a useful thing because, well, you need the whole cohomological apparatus in order, yeah, in, in order to study it for various groups. Okay. Um, so now we have two sources of quasimorphisms and they never intersect. I mean, you can show that the only way, sorry, two sources of approximate subgroups. You can show that the only way that the kernel of a quasi-morphism will be commensurable to one that comes from uh, by, to a pullback by homomorphism is in the case of both the trivial. Um, all right. Well, um, here's the first version of the theorem. And in this version, I don't mention explicitly, oh, yeah, I don't mention quasi-morphism exactly. I just mentioned, okay, I don't know, maybe it's better approximate homomorphism. So approximate. Quasi-morphism for some reason implies that the target is the real. And here I'm not saying that. This is something that puts together the two sources still. Uh, so there's a locally compact topological group H and an approximate homomorphism. So it has an error set, but the error set is at least compact. Um, I forget. Yeah, so the error set is, is compact. It's called L because it will coincide. I mean, what you can take it to be is the Lascar neighbors of the identity that we discussed last time. But here for this theorem, it doesn't matter immediately. It's just some compact conjugation invariant subset. Um, and you have an approximate homomorphism such that the basically it pulls back the commensurability class of compact open neighborhoods of the identity of compact neighborhoods of the identity to the commensurability class of lambda. That's essentially what this thing, these two properties say. And uh, yeah, specifically the error set itself is supposed to go to something bounded because it's compact, so it should go to something bounded. So I'm being a bit precise about that. It goes to lambda to the 12. 
well, precise in giving a, an upper bound, maybe it's lambda to the 10 or less, I don't know. Um, and the third, the fourth thing is much more, much more model theoretic statement. So if you are used to this from in the past, then to say in continuous logic that F from G into H or H is compact or locally compact, to say that this is definable is to say that when you have two disjoint compact subsets of age, the pullbacks can be separated by a definable set. That's the notion of definability of maps in continuous logic into compact sets, or here it's into locally compact. Um, well, so this I don't have, I'm not saying this, but there's some error scale such that if you get above that, so you don't see very well in a very small resolution, but just when you get above that resolution sufficiently, so if two sets are not only disjoint, but they are at distance four from each other, so, so to speak, then that's true. Then you can separate them by definable set. I first thought that this was just a model theoretic addendum, which wouldn't matter for the group theory, but it seems to me now that I was wrong. And actually this makes the group theory much easier later, as maybe I'll say on Thursday. Uh, but this really, this one really involves a bit more model theory than I did yesterday. Things like, well, still using the T def of yesterday first to show definability there, and then using some version of Beth theorem in order to deduce it in the original language. Um, L two is not assumed to L is not assumed to be open, right? It's just normal and comp it's compact. It's uh, not open. Yeah. Okay. The best case is that it's the identity. Then I, then I just have a homomorphism. The smaller it is, the stronger the theorem is in some sense. Okay. It's not open, but uh, what you understand instead of, so in, in the previous version, you, you understood pullbacks of open sets. Here you understand only pullbacks of open subsets of L, open neighborhoods of L. So, yeah, so again, the smaller L is the better it is. Udi, what is the content of, of this theorem when uh, when you have, when it's amenable? Does it make it better? Yeah, you can make it better by declaring that L equals one. Then you get exactly the old theorem. But, but okay. can you, okay. but can you get it by this proof also or? Yes. Okay. This Christoph, I don't know. It's, I, well, I don't see people. Yes, yes, yes. That's me, but uh, I just start on the microphone. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, yes, so I, I, I will get to it. I, I, I made a okay. remark about it, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, I can say it now. I think you get a new proof uh, in the case where the approximate subgroup is literally amenable in the group theoretic sense. In other words, you have a finite added measure on all the subsets. I'm not sure if definably amenable is enough for this, for that. But uh, yeah, um, yeah. But it's, but in in any in any in any case, definitely it's new because as so you yeah. So all the previous proofs went down, and here you cannot go down. You have to look at the scale somehow between lambda and lambda to the twelve, and just recognize a locally compact group there. Um, Okay, I don't know, is Tammy Ziegler here? Yeah. She asked me a very challenging question on Thursday and I promised to say something, uh, but I, uh, probably she's not. Um, yeah, let's see what this implies. So I'm going to give a version of that in the case where it's the top commensurability class. And I'm actually going to assume, so suppose X is actually commensurable to G and I'm going to assume even that it has a power which equal G, but I'm not bounding that power initially, okay? Well, because we had the explicit thing three, this still has a meaning. Um, so, okay. So it follows from this uh, statement, if you think about it, that you can look at this statement, you say, well, it gives some, model, which is a locally compact group. If this locally compact group is trivial, what can you say? Okay, so the answer is even in this very, very basic case that if the locally compact, the canonical locally compact group, which is associated with it, 
which will be compact under our assumption because the compact behave like the powers of X. So some power, approximately the compact to the M will be all of the V group, okay? So get a canonically associated compact group. What if it's trivial? Well, if it's trivial, you can conclude that the generation actually happens in at most 12 steps. So that's part of the content um, of that theorem. And Tammy asked me if I'm able to explain that without giving the proof as opposed to proving it. And I really thought about it uh, since Thursday because that's really the more, what I would like to do most. Um, yeah, I mean, the ideal thing would be to find, in the same way that Gromov gave the description of looking at a group from a distance, I would, I, I would love to find some description like that, which would somehow explain this. I'm able to prove it much more rapidly. So here you have the proof just using the material from last time without going into local logic and lots of other things. Uh, namely, this is the idea of how to deduce from the material of last time, this kind of thing on groups. So it's very simple. You take your group G and it has the approximate subgroup X and you basically look at the Cayley graph. So you look at G without remembering anything about G. You don't remember what is the identity element, but you remember uh, this kind of multiplic torso multiplication that, uh, okay, it allows you to translate and by elements of G. And you remember the Cayley graph. In other words, you remember when things, when, y, when X is in, sorry, uh, so D equals X. I don't know. Um, this should be X there. So you remember when little x lies in x times y, I guess. Okay. So, uh, so you have a point and then you have x times that point. And then if you want to go distance two, you should pick a point here and you do x times that point. So a distance two ball in this graph is exactly x squared times a, that would be a distance two ball and so on. So in this story, um, the fact that you start to do an approximate subgroup translates into saying that a ball of radius two is the union of finitely many balls of radius one. It's called the doubling property. Okay, so this is some structure, it's some theory, and we can form the core space of that. And the automorphism group of that is the canonical compact Hausdorff group uh, associated to this theory, so it's associated to G with this uh, approximate subgroup. So, so Udi, what, what is the H there in the odd J H? It does an H. It means that I go to the Hausdorffization. Okay, so we said that G, well, J and odd of J are only quasi compact, but there's a canonical way of getting uh, a Hausdorff thing from it. Um, yeah, so the point is that um, J is not going to be tri trivial if the diameter of X is at least 12. So basically, maybe I wrote it, I wrote it down somewhere. Um, if you have two types that are far away, so um, this type is a type of some elements in a ball around A and this one in a ball around B and A and B are a distance 10 or something like that. You have the retraction to rho of P, rho of Q that lie in J. And the point is that the pattern language sees that these are at large distance. There's, a, there's something which is never, which is omitted, which is never realized. Namely, these are types, but you never have elements, let's say B bar and A bar in the model, uh, such that, well, the distance of A and A bar is one and the distance of B and B bar is one, and yet the distance of A bar and B bar is eight. This never happens. Since it never happens, this is something you can say in the pattern language, so the same story will be true in J. 
And therefore, well, going to the pattern space can cause enormous collapse. It will definitely collapse indiscernible sets, for example. But, um, well, indiscernible sets will be in a small neighborhood of this space. They cannot, you know, you, if the whole radius is some finite radius M, then you cannot have an indiscernible set of things which are far from each other, right? And anyway, this argument shows that large distances are preserved. They may go down by one, but it's a canonical way of collapsing some indiscernible sequences, getting something compact, but or locally, yeah, in this case, compact, but nevertheless, not shrinking distances too much. So that's okay. That's the best explanation that I can give. Maybe it's more like a proof than an explanation, but. Uh, uh, you can ask a question? Uh, yes, Anna. Yeah. yeah, just in this thing, can you, uh, can you also conclude here that just from the from Lascar group being trivial, then you get the same conclusion? Um, I don't think so. I, I don't think that's probably true. Um, oh, okay. Because even by the basic Ziegler example, it seems to me they have trivial Lascar group. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, but I mean, if you take the interval from from one to you know the arc of radius one over L of the circle, you'll take it L steps, which is unbounded. Mm -hmm. So no, so yeah, so this kind of thing is ca so this group is faithful to the structure up to a bounded level, but the Lascar group is not. Okay, so, okay, thank sorry, you, thank you. Sorry, yeah, Udi, that's a good question. one more question about this proof, because uh, I, I, I understood that you showed that in this kernel J, you have uh, points which are far away, but yeah. how do you get that, uh, how it contradicts that the, the, the group of automorphisms is trivial? You have to do a few more steps. I just, ah, did, I, see. Okay. I just did one step, but, okay. but the other steps are kind of more routine, but well, maybe this is, what, anyway, there's one other step which is very essential, namely you go to the Hausdorffization and you have to check that this can only, what does it collapse? It identifies two points if all their neighborhoods intersect. And that implies in particular that they have distance at most two also. Mm -hmm. So it contributes to increasing the 12 a bit, but not only by, not much. Um, no, yeah, there are other parts of the proof. I wrote it in a different place in the slides a bit more, but I'm not sure I will get, in fact, I'm getting really worried about the time. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so that was one version of the theorem and two improvements that you can uh, do is first of all, you can change the uh, approximate subgroup to a Lie group. And second of all, you can change the kernel um, to an abelian group. And when you do that, you can say that any approximate subgroup is obtained in two steps in the following way. First, you take an infinitely definable subgroup that we're used to. So you take a continuous homomorphism from, uh, no, not from, um, from whatever group you're in, into a Lie group and you just pull back, uh, so you just have a homomorphism. Uh, well, we can look at the associated infinitely definable subgroup. So gamma is the kernel of rho, okay? That somehow, we're used to the fact that the definable approximations to that give you a commensurability class, okay? But within gamma, you can also find finitely many quasimorphisms, also continuous into the reals such that taking the uh, pullback of a bounded set by each of them, uh, that gives you the, the correct thing. So it gives you an infinitely definable approximate subgroup uh, whose definable approximations determine the commensurability class that you are looking for. Okay, so it's still an approximate subgroup. That's because of the phi i's, but it's very clear how you get it by homomorphism into a Lie group. So you get another infinitely definable subgroup and then followed by finitely many quasimorphisms. Um, 
okay, so this uses uh, some group theory, which at first I couldn't find and somehow I needed to do it more by hand, but eventually it was pointed out to me, uh, uh, Yves de Cornelier pointed out to me how to quote it from the literature. Uh, so yeah, so the additional thing here to what happened before is the assertion that this L, the closure of what it generates can be taken to be Rn. Um, and basically it's, uh, what is more familiar is the theory of FC groups. So if you have groups with finite conjugacy classes, then the classical group theory theorems saying that uh, they look after you factor out a normal, finite normal subgroup, they are a billion. And there's an analogous thing for compacts, which is somehow uh, more difficult uh, because the endomorphisms of a compact might not, well, non-compact groups can act on compact groups more than infinite groups can, can act on finite groups. But anyway, uh, it basically exists. Um, okay. Yeah, so this is the remark that Christoph already asked me and I mentioned. Um, okay, great, yeah. Um, ah, so now, yeah, now what I was planning to do, but maybe I'll just, dearly, do I have more time or not at all? Well, I have to admit, not really. Um, okay, I know you started late, okay. but it is four minutes to the hour. Yeah, that's all right. So, I mean, what I was planning to do is go back to, summarize what we did yesterday in the local case and to explain a little bit how to deduce that theorem from that. But um, I somehow did that uh, verbally and uh, I will say it again. Um, yeah, next time, next time we're going to introduce one more assumption of discreteness and see that you can get rid in certain situations there of the, um, of the quasimorphism part easily and get back into uh, a very nice, um, well, structure theorem, which also, well, variants of which were also obtained by Simon Machado by other methods. Um, okay, yeah, sorry, so I'll stop here. Okay, well, let's thank Udi for that lovely talk. <laughs> Now we have one question in, in the chat here. Oh. Richard Boland, do you want to repeat that out loud? <laughs>